I spent 30 days in the federal shoe for my participation in a huge medical facility theft ring. So let's talk about it. Hey, hey, what's up everybody? Shout out to all the law-abiding criminals out there. As always, you know what to do. This is your first time on the channel when you want to hear more prison stories, learn more about what life is like inside prison, go ahead and subscribe. And click that notification bell so you don't miss anything. What's up, guys? As you can see, I'm out here kicking it with my homeboy, Bob. I don't remember what it stands for, but Bob does actually have a meaning. That is why they call him that. He's basically an MMA dummy. But I just call him Bob, a.k.a. Bobby, a.k.a. OG Bobby Johnson, whatever you want to call him. It's my dude. He's with me. We're getting into this video. So as I said in that intro, guys, I was in federal prison. And before I get too far into the story, I just want to go ahead and say for all the people that like to get in my comments with their BS and say that I'm snitching and say that I shouldn't be doing this because I'm screwing it up for everybody. Well, let me go ahead and nip all that in the bud. Nobody's snitching here because this was not a street crime. It cannot be prosecuted. We did our whole time. The investigation was closed. They actually caught us doing what we were doing. They weren't able to stick us with the charges, but they did shut the whole operation down. You cannot do this anymore the way that we did it. So here's how the whole scenario went down. I was on a crew that worked in medical, and there were five of us that worked on this crew at the prison that I was at. Our jobs included a number of things. We would wax floors, mop floors, clean offices. We'd go in the nurse's office, take out their trash, so on and so forth. Anything that had to be done in the medical part of the prison we were responsible for it. We were also on the blood spill cleanup crew. There's another video in there that I have to tell you about the time that I literally walked into like a murder scene with blood all over the place. So as part of the medical crew, we would get like a little certification, I guess you would call it, to be able to, you know, we learned about pathogens, bloodborne pathogens, all these different things, and we would be certified to be able to clean up blood spill. So if there was a fight, riot, whatever happened, if there was blood to be cleaned up, they would call us out to come and get it and clean it up. Now, it goes without saying, man, that we are convicts. A lot of us are in there. and We are trying to do right and get our lives together and everything. And a lot of us spend our time positively and we try to change. But listen, if an opportunity presents itself to a convict, man, a lot of times they'll take advantage of it. And that's just a way of life in prison. And so this was an opportunity that presented itself to us and we took advantage of it. The way that this place was laid out. We had the office of the guy who was basically over the inmates that worked at medical. But in the back in medical, there was like a little laundry room. And that's where they would wash their mop heads and different things like that. It was back in the area where they had a suicide cell and where they would do the eye exams. And so the supply closet was right next to the laundry room. You had one door here, one door here, side by side. But they were separated, obviously, by a concrete block wall. Well, the laundry room is where we would go to kick it and hang out whenever we didn't have anything to do. It was at the back of medical. All the people at the front couldn't see us. We were out of the way and we would sometimes just post up there on the washer and the dryer, play cards, whatever it was. Our cleaning supplies were in there. It was like our little closet. Well, inside this laundry room area, there was a little door up in the ceiling and it was probably, if I had to guess, I'd say maybe 12 by 12 square, like a foot square metal door. Now, obviously, you're not going to have a key to it or anything like that. Only the maintenance crews are going to have keys to that. And that's not inmates. The officers are the only ones. It was apparently a little access hatch just to be able to get up into the ceiling in case they needed to access any like HVAC stuff, pipes, whatever. Convicts being convicts, we figured out a way to get into it and to make it look like it was not being gotten into. So basically we had access to this hatch to where we could close it, it would look perfectly normal, but we could open it anytime we wanted to. That gives us access to the ceiling on the inside of the facility, the medical part at least. Now, our bright idea was the supply closet was right next to us. Supply closet houses all kinds of things that are highly valuable on a compound. Alcohol pads, I know it sounds crazy, but these things are in high demand. Guys want the little tear open alcohol pads to clean their face, sanitize things, whatever it may be. You've got shoe inserts like padding for shoes, knee braces, ankle braces, elbow braces, wrist braces, 
All these things were in this closet and this was stuff that was really, really hard to get because medical in prison is some shit. They don't want to give you anything if they can get away with not giving it to you. Now, as I've told you guys before in some of my other videos, on the Federal Compound Man, books of stamps are literally money. You carried it, they got what's called a flat book, which is just a put-together book of stamps like you would buy out the store. Then they have what they call compound books, which are stamps that have been tore, individual stamps, and they'll wrap them up in like a little stick it note, and it'll be 20 stamps, and that's a compound book. Compound book value is less than the flat book value. The bottom line is... Some of these items would go for a flat book of stamps on the compound. A knee brace, back braces could go for two or three flat books of stamps. Now at the time that I was on the yard, flat books of stamps were $7. Compound books could be anywhere from 5 to 6 so There was definitely money to be made in this operation. Now I will not be naming any names of the guys that were involved. Like I said, there was five of us. I'm not going to say who they were. But I will say that we had one guy who was really athletic, kind of short. He was the very first one that went up into the access hatch, went over the concrete block wall. There was a drop down ceiling. Now, for those that don't know, that's like the, I guess, particle board or foam, whatever you call it, that you see in a lot of office buildings. You can push them up. Well, you pick that up, you move it out the way, and you would literally be sitting and straddling the concrete block wall, and you could drop into the supply closet. Now, he made the very first run that we ever did. He went over there, everybody said what they wanted. Hey, I want two knee braces, I want this many alcohol pads, whatever it was. Everybody basically put in a small order. We were test running this thing. And boom, we have our first lick that we hit inside the federal prison. The guy that went up was also what we would call the hustle man. This dude could sell anything to anybody. He was just a con that knew everybody. He moved between all races. He could talk to anybody, sell anything. He had the weed, he had the tobacco, and obviously, at this point, he had our medical items, so we gave it all to him. We would give him a little cut, and he would just sell it for us. Well, this guy ended up going to the shoe for an unrelated thing a few months before we did. So that left me to be the one to go up. I'm skinny, so I was like, you know what? It's cool. I can pull up in there. I was in good shape at the time. No problem. Let's do it. So I go up. We do another run probably three or four weeks later. I get a whole entire big garbage bag full of stuff. Put it back down through the access. We get it. We come off lovely. No worries. The access door is able to be closed. They can't even tell that it's been open. We're good. This goes on for probably a month. I would go up periodically, maybe once a week. We would try to keep it to where we didn't hit them too, too hard, but we also wanted to make the money. We had it really sweet on this crew because nothing had ever been done like this. So at the time, there wasn't like a whole lot of supervision. We would have what you would call a late night. There's always got to be a medical staff on call at this prison. So if you had a late night, basically they would keep us after the 4 o'clock count, during the 4 o'clock count, and we would stay after to wax floors or whatever. That way there's no traffic in medical. Everybody's going home except for that one staff member. So really, if we wanted to, we could wax the floors in such a way that would separate us from where that individual was in the building, and we would have complete access to whatever we wanted without having to worry about him coming to us. You guys know how it goes, man, the natural progression of things. Once you start tasting a little bit of money, you want to expand, you want to get more and more, and that's exactly how this happened. We started looking at ways to get into other areas, offices where they would have boxes of brand new pens and things. These jail pens could go for four or five stamps a piece on the compound. We were looking at trying to get stuff like real free world food that might be left, some candy, whatever. If it's in the drawer of a person's workplace, we were going and we were getting it. Because now that I have been up in the roof and the ceiling and seen everything, I know how the whole thing is laid out. I could go up there and see, during the daytime at least, the whole entire area of medical over everybody's office, where the concrete block walls were, where I could go and where I couldn't. And a couple of these missions that I have been on to get in some of these rooms were literally like some ninja shit you see on a movie. I would have to be going over backwards, hanging on to pipes, going under, over, bracing myself on one leg. I was almost like a damn gymnast crawling around in the ceiling of a federal prison trying to steal these people's shit. And it went good for a while. It seemed like they would never notice that anything was missing. We would drop down, get the pins, get the little candies and everything. And we were working on trying to get over to the pharmacy. Now that right there probably was the beginning of the end for us. We shouldn't have been thinking about that pharmacy because when you do some shit like that, only off chance that they did actually have some kind of like opioids or anything in their pills, 
if we would have done that, that could have been free world charges for us. Lucky for us, we never made it that far because this was the beginning of the end and this is how it all went down. We're up there in medical on a late night one night. We wax ourselves into a different part of the building that I've told them I need to go up in the ceiling here. That way I can try to go into the pharmacy and we'll be able to get whatever we can get there. Now dentistry was right here beside the pharmacy. So the plan was I would drop down in dentistry. We would see if they had anything like Lattacane, whatever. We didn't really know what the hell we were getting it for. But hey, it was there and we just wanted to see what we could do. Then we could try to make it into the pharmacy which was next to it. So that's exactly what we did. We waxed in the floors and I actually went in the ceiling. And my dude had come back out of the hole who had went to the hole who was the first guy that was going up. He came back, got his job back. He was with me. So we both went up in the ceiling at the same time. And we were going to try to do whatever we could do. So we go up. We drop down into the dentistry area. So far, so good. Everything's waxed off. The guy can't come back. He can't see what we've done. They're all acting like everything's cool, waxing, whatever, sweeping, fake mopping. And for about the first five minutes, we're good. We're walking around the dentistry. We're looking in the little cabinet, seeing what we can see, grabbing what we can grab. And lo and behold, we hear keys to the dentistry door. Now, if you want to talk about a panic level 5000, we are both in this damn dentistry office and you hear the door go to open. There's nowhere you can go. We've got the dentistry chairs and there's like a shelf next to each one, but pretty much, man, we're in a wide open room. There is a little cut around whenever you first walk through and they've got like files and records there. But we hear the keys hit the door and obviously the guy knew that he couldn't come around the way that we were to go and use the bathroom. So he was just going to cut through dentistry and go back and use the bathroom that way. And that's where the saying comes from that it only takes one slip up to make a whole operation go down because we did not consider that possibility. And so he is coming through the door and me and my dude are just standing there like, oh shit, what do we do? So my guy dips around a little cut where the files are. Now he is out of his sight when he opens the door, but if the guy just turns around and looks, he'll see him right there. The only thing I could do was dip down up under one of the chairs, not under the chair, but the little cut with the shelf that's next to it. The chair is here and there's like a little alcove. And so I got there under that in between right by the chair and I just sat there froze. I didn't know what to do. We hear him come through the door. He walks through and I have an unobstructed open view right there looking at him going through the other door into the hall to hit the restroom. All he had to do was just look like that or out the corner of his eye and he would have saw me hiding right there. He didn't see me. He goes through the door, carries on and me and my dude are as shook as we've ever been. Heart rates through the roof. We're like, dude, let's get the hell up out of here. So we go back up into the ceiling in a panic because we almost just caught when in actuality we should have kept it cool, but we didn't. Heat of the moment. We go up and when we go back up into the ceiling, we leave some dust residue. I don't know if you've ever done anything with the uh, drop down ceiling, but when you move it around, some of it will come off and it's almost like... Uh, uh, drywall inside of a house. So we left some residue on the desk that we were using to get back up into the ceiling. So we drop back down in the hallway. We tell everybody what happened. Nobody goes back up in the ceiling. I'm like, dude, I know that we left some residue behind. We got to go back and get it. Everybody voted not to do it. There's really nothing that we can do. We just pulled out the rest of our shift and we went back to our cells. Nobody hardly slept that night after we all talked to each other because we knew we were standing a good chance of getting caught. We wake up the next morning, try to go to work, boom, nobody can come into work. So we're like, damn. We go to the rec yard and we start bending the track and walking around the track and we're all talking like, okay, this is gonna be our story. Nobody's gonna say anything. We're not gonna do anything. We're just gonna see what happens and that's gonna be that. So we're good for the whole entire day, man. We go to lunch, we do breakfast, everything. And we're thinking, all right, man, we're good. They do have medical clothes, so we know that they know something is going on. We go back for the four o'clock count. Now, me and my celly were both on this medical crew. So neither one of us slept the night before because we were so damn worried about everything. So we decided to catch us a nap during the four o'clock count. I can't say how much time went by, but all I know is that all of a sudden I got woke up out of my sleep. The officers are at the door and they're telling us to back up to the flap and cuff up. For anybody that don't know what that means, you got a bean hole in your door. They call it the flap. It's a little door they can open to put a tray through. When they're locking you up, they tell you to back up to it. Put your wrist through. They cuff you. They cuff us both up. 
take us to the shoe. They got all of us in the little holding tank area. In the shoe, they have an area where you go until you get dressed out. I've said that in another video. And when you get back to your cell, then you're actually like booked in, I guess you could call it. So while we're all in the holding tank, we're just like, listen, man, they don't know anything unless we tell them anything. All they know is that there's some damn residue or whatever on that desk and that somebody had been in the ceiling, but they can't prove nothing because none of us had any of this stuff in our lockers. They searched our lockers and didn't find anything. And that was the end of it. We spent our 30 days in the shoe under what they call an investigation. And that's the max amount of time they can hold you. It might be 28. I can't remember the exact time, but I know it's around a month. The max amount of time that they can hold you under an investigation without actually putting a charge on you. Everybody shut their mouth. Nobody said anything. And we did our little 30 days and they let us right back out. Now, we never could go back to medical. We never got our jobs back or anything. But we didn't catch charges either. And that was a beautiful thing. So guys, there you have it, man. That is the story. And I hope you guys enjoyed this content. There will be more coming soon. Until next time.